Welcome back to the third video in my WebGL tutorial series, and as appropriate for video number three, we're going to make the jump from 2D to 3D rendering this video, which is a topic I've been really excited to talk about. A lot of the beauty in 3D rendering comes from simulating the interaction between light and the materials the objects in your scene are made from. But the process of rendering 3D objects at all deserves its own video, so I'm going to save the fancy lighting stuff for the next video. For now, we're going to stick with old, like old school 3D graphics by rendering all of our surfaces as solid colors. It's still enough to create the illusion of three dimensions, and it reminds me of the N64 games I used to love to play. Buckle up, first we've got some math to cover. Hopefully just enough to give you good intuition for why the code later in the video works, but not so much that you need to scratch your head about it. The two core primitives of linear algebra that we use for computer graphics are vectors and matrices. We've already been using vectors quite a bit, but I want to take a step back and talk about them some more. When playing with geometry, you can think of vectors in a couple of ways. The first and probably most familiar is to think of a vector as a point at an x and y coordinate. We'll add a third z coordinate later, the math and intuition remain the same. It can also be useful to imagine an arrow pointing from the origin to that same point. They're the same mathematically, so just use whichever one helps you visualize the problem at hand. For example, if you have a bird in your scene, 1 meter west and 3 meters north of the player, that location is probably best represented with a point, and the fact that it's flying directly southeast is a good use for an arrow representation. You can add together two vectors, which geometrically looks like moving the second vector to start at the end of the first and finding where the combination vectors point. You can do this in either order, just like with regular addition. We used this in the last video to add a movement vector to a position vector and find an updated position vector. Take a moment to let the geometry of vector addition sink in. It'll be very handy when you're constructing 3D scenes of your own. Subtraction also works pretty similar to regular mathematics, and you can think of it in one of two ways. Flip around the second vector to face the opposite direction and then perform a regular addition. Or it's often useful to think of vector subtraction as finding the vector that points from the end of B to the end of A. Once again, both are correct, but I find this second form is more often helpful. Finally, you have scalar multiplication, where you multiply a vector by a regular number, called a scalar. This stretches or shrinks the input vector. One common and useful tool is to express directions as vectors with a total length of 1, so that when you multiply them by some desired distance or strength or whatever, you find a vector that goes a specific length in a specific direction. Boy, let's take a break from talking about mathematics to instead talk about how you can project a 3D shape onto a 2D surface. Boom, shucks. That just sounds like more math. So when I make a shadow puppet like this, I'm doing two things. First of all, I'm realizing how little dexterity I have in that pinky finger. And second of all, I'm taking a 3D shape my hands, to cast a 2D shadow on the wall behind me. Now there's two pretty important things that I want you to notice here. The first one is that if I put my hand pretty close to the light here, it ends up casting a shadow that's much, much larger than my real hand. Now this is the same effect that makes things that are far away from us look smaller than things that are up close. This gets a lot more obvious if I pull up the cell phone camera footage right here, and you can see as I make these shapes, the shadow is the exact same size from the perspective of the camera as the real hands are. And that also leads me into my second observation, that not only is the shadow the same size, but it takes up the same shape and same location from the camera's point of view. We can use this to our advantage. If we can figure out the 2D shadow shape of a 3D something, we can figure out the size, shape, and location of that 3D thing on a 2D generated image. So vectors can encode positions in multiple dimensions, and matrices can encode basic operations on those vectors. By multiplying a vector by a matrix like so, you get a new vector with the result of that operation. Notice the vector goes on the right-hand side of the matrix. Generally, in OpenGL, we use column vectors. We have to do something kind of weird in 3D graphics and introduce a fourth dimension. This fourth dimension doesn't encode anything interesting, no fourth spatial dimension, nor time, or any other property really, it just holds the number 1. Or 0 if you're dealing with rotations, but 1 for positional data. Because of how vectorized operations work on CPUs and GPUs, a 3D vector normally takes up four components anyways, 
and adding this fourth dimension allows us to condense what would normally be many separate calculations into one matrix multiplication. The first matrix common in 3D graphics is the model transformation matrix, which itself is the result of three operations performed one after another. I've expressed each of these operations as their own matrix, and combined them with multiplication into a model matrix, M. The order of matrix multiplication matters. Operations go from right to left when working with column vectors. The first operation is scale, which moves each input vertex proportionally closer or further from the origin, effectively resizing the input shape. The second operation is rotation, which in three dimensions can be defined as a rotation of some angle about some axis of rotation. Imagine sticking a rod through the object in the direction of the axis and twisting that rod by some angle to get the desired rotation. The third operation is translation, which is just moving the shape by some constant offset. This is the first operation that's impossible to do with a 3x3 matrix on 3D vectors, but it becomes possible with that fourth extra 1 dimension. This combined model matrix fills the role of the scale and offset variables we used in the last video to move shapes around our scene, but in a more general and powerful way. The second matrix I want to talk about is the view matrix, which is used to figure out where a piece of geometry is with respect to a virtual camera in our scene. Under the hood, the view matrix does the same thing as the model transformation matrix in reverse, but we generally create them with different parameters. The position of the camera in space, where the camera is pointed towards, generally called the look at vector, and which direction the top of the camera is facing, or which way is up from the camera's perspective. The third and final matrix we use for 3D graphics is also related to the camera, and has to do more or less with how the lens is set up to capture an image. This is called the projection matrix, and while there are different types of projection matrices, we generally use one called the perspective projection matrix. The important parameter to consider for the art direction of your scene is the field of view, usually defined as an angle in the y direction, and this is how wide of an angle your camera is capturing. The aspect ratio is the width of the output window divided by the height. In this example, my viewport is 6x4 Manum library units, but for standard 1080p, 1440p, and 4K outputs, we would use a 16x9 aspect ratio. The near and far planes are the closest and furthest distances from the camera, respectively, that can be drawn. Pick whatever you want here, within reason. Anything closer than the near distance, or further from the far distance, won't be drawn. And with that, we're all done with the linear algebra we need in this video. Hooray! We'll cover a bit more when we talk about lighting operations, but believe me, the hardest is behind us. The last concept I want to cover before diving into the code is index buffers. When I was learning computer graphics, index buffers seemed unintuitive and clunky, so I want to take a minute to show you why they're useful. Up to this point, we've been manually defining all of the vertices in our geometry, thinking particularly about triangles. Here's the vertex data we would use for a simple indigo triangle. Let's extend this to a square and add a second triangle with three more vertices, something like this. Notice that two of the vertices in the second triangle are identical to the vertices already defined in the first triangle. In this particular square, the top left and lower right corners are defined twice. On the GPU, each vertex is stored as a series of six floating point values, and each of those floats takes up four bytes of space for a total vertex buffer size of 144 bytes for this square. That number isn't very important and will vary with which effects you're using in your shaders, but we'll come back to it. To use index drawing, we do two things. First, remove duplicates from our vertex buffer, and second, create a new index buffer that contains a list of integer indices. At the primitive assembly stage, these indices are grouped into sets of three, and vertices are read from the vertex buffer at the specified offsets starting at zero. By removing duplicate vertices, we reduced the size of our vertex buffer to 96 bytes. We had to add six new index buffer values, but each one of those only takes up the space of a 16-bit integer for a grand total of 12 bytes of index data. The total memory for the square is now 108 bytes, which is 25% smaller than the original size. 
Each vertex only has to be processed once by the vertex shader, and also, generally speaking, reducing memory footprint improves hardware cache performance, so we potentially get some real performance benefits here as well. And rectangles are an important example because artist-created geometry is often full of them. Rectangles are much easier to deal with, artistically, than haphazard triangles, so that 25% savings figure ends up being more or less realistic for practical 3D scenes. Now, on to the code. Third time's the charm. I got a good 10 minutes into editing the raw footage before realizing I didn't capture any of the browser windows, and on the second take, it became crazy stupid obvious that my audio setup just wasn't going to work anymore. <sighs> so I sound really different, and you see git divs complaining in this video, that's why to both. I'm going to structure the code a bit differently from here on out. The source code will go into a source directory, and that's just to keep this top folder a bit less cluttered. I'll make a intro to 3D TypeScript file and bring over the show error function from the last videos and use it to make sure our source code is running correctly before getting too far into things. We need a couple new packages for this tutorial. The first one is glmatrix, run npm install gl-matrix to add that to our project. This gives us nice linear algebra types so that we don't have to implement all the formulas to make model, view, transformation matrices ourselves. In order to use that library in our code, we'll also set up a JavaScript bundler called Webpack. Webpack mashes multiple source files into one big bundled JavaScript file that's easy to include in a index.html file. It's nice, very worth the two whole minutes it'll take to set up. Run npm install, dash dash save dash dev, webpack, ts dash loader, webpack dash cli. TS Loader is a Webpack add-on that allows us to use TypeScript source files. Webpack is the bundler itself, and Webpack CLI gives us a nice command line tool we can use in place of the TSC command to build and watch our code. I'll update our package JSON to do that here. TS Config needs a couple small changes. Webpack will be in charge of figuring out which files to load, so I can get rid of this files array, and I want to change the output directory to this dist folder. I'll also turn on source maps. I don't use them in this video, but it'll be useful for you to be able to turn them on in case you want to debug in the browser somewhere. Finally, we need to configure Webpack, which happens in webpack.config.js. I'm going to bring over the config file from Webpack's TypeScript basic setup page, link in the description, and make a couple quick changes. Entry is which TypeScript source file we want to compile to JavaScript, and that'll also bring along with it all the code that it imports from other files. For us, that's source slash intro to 3 dts This section describes how certain files should be interpreted by Webpack. We aren't using JSX or React or anything, so we can simplify this to only take in .ts files. We can do the same thing in the resolve array, we're only authoring plain TypeScript source files. You can leave these in too. I'm taking them out just because we don't need them. I want our output to be named intro to 3d.js and live in the dist folder of this project. Now if I run npm run build, webpack complains a bit. I'll add two more lines since this is a development only project that I won't be publishing to production somewhere. Mode is development, and dev tools is inline source map. Here's the bundled JavaScript file. You can see it's a right old mess, our code is definitely in there, but Webpack throws in its own nonsense too. To update index.html, I'll change the title, and whoops, there's the formatter going. Whatever. Our JavaScript source file name also changed to dist slash intro to 3d.js. If I open up this page in Firefox, looks like it works. Great. I'll run npm run dev to watch for changes and recompile, update the error message, make sure it works. Great, we're ready to get under the WebGL code now. If I go back to the last tutorial code, you can see that like a third of the code is common functions that we pulled out to simplify the main demo function. It prevents code duplication, which is great, but it also means that our actual demo code doesn't start until, wow, line 300 or so. Ooh. I want to take it a step further and pull all of this common WebGL overhead code into its own file, which I'll call gl-utils.ts. Let's see, show error is something we'll reuse all the time, so let's move it over. I'll add the export keyword here, signaling that this is a function that we might want to use in other files. And to show you that it works, let's jump back over to the main intro to 3D file, 
Instead of redefining this function here, we import it from glutils. I'll change the message a bit, and great, you can see that it works. Cool. What else? The shader code is specific to each individual app, so is all this geometry stuff. But we should pull over the create static vertex buffer, create program, get context, and eh, get random and range, why not? They'll seem pretty generally useful, so let's grab them. And if you're just joining for this video, you haven't seen the others, or you don't have the code from the others, I'll link the GitHub repo in the comments where I keep the code for all the videos in this series. We can clean up the code a bit by moving geometry definitions into their own files, since it's a lot of lines of code that are just numbers. We won't really reuse this between videos, probably, but it'll help us keep a nice clean main file. I'll call this file geometry.ts, and we'll put the vertex and index data for the cubes and table surfaces in this file. It turns out that drawing a cube is a super common thing in tutorials, so I'm just going to copy from Daddy Mozilla's notes. I've linked the page I used in the notes, and I'll link it again in the description. I'll copy the vertex positions, and change the spacing so that each vertex has its own line. I'll linger a bit on each one of these faces so that you can pause if you're typing them in manually. We need both position and RGB color data, and I'm arbitrarily choosing to put them next to each other in the same buffer. I'll set the front and back to red, top and bottom to blue, and left and right to green. Great! We have our vertex buffer that defines each square face in terms of its four corners, so now we need an index buffer to declare how triangles should be made out of that soup of vertices. We can use 8, 16, or 32-bit integers, WebGL supports all of them. I usually just stick with 16 out of habit, you went 16 arrays. Once again, we'll pull this from the Mozilla MDN page, and I'm going to adjust the spacing to put one triangle face per line. The front face vertices are 0, 1, 2, and 0, 2, 3. Going back up to my vertex definition, that means that the first triangle is drawn with the first, second, and third vertex, and our second triangle is drawn with the first, third, and fourth vertices. I'll put the index for each vertex, starting at 0, in a comment right here. Well, after this you get the point. Cool! Uh, we need another piece of geometry for our table surface. I'll copy these top face vertices here and use them. I'll set y equals 0 for these vertices so that it's on the ground, and I'll make it 10 times as big in the x and z dimensions. For the color, I'll use this gray color, RGB equals 0 0.2 for each. I'll copy over the index data for the top face, but this vertex buffer is a lot shorter and the indices don't line up anymore, so I'll subtract 8 from each one of them to get the right numbers. That's 0, 1, 2, 0, 2, 3. I'm going to put the VAO binding utility function here as well, which will look basically the same as the last video with uh, some really small changes. Create the VAO, make sure it exists. Quick note, I'm using Visual Studio Code and have a control space import functions shortcut. It adds the import statement at the top of the file, but if you don't have that, you can also type this in manually. Back to the VAO function, bind the VAO, enable the position and color attributes, bind our vertex buffer and set the attribute bindings for position and color. As a quick recap, the parameters are the attribute to bind, number and type of elements in that attribute, the normalized parameter, which doesn't do anything for float buffers, the total byte size of a vertex, and how far from the front of a vertex this attribute starts. Next, we bind the index buffer with the element array buffer WebGL slot. There's no attributes to associate here, and there's only one type of index buffer binding, it's an index buffer. With that done, we can unbind the VAO to stop setting properties on it, and I'm going to unbind the element array buffer as well, but I'm pretty sure that's not actually necessary. No harm doing it again. Return the VAO, and it's done. Next, let's define our shaders. The shaders change surprisingly little from the last video, so I'll just copy them over. Let's go through the vertex shader line by line. The version and precision declarations stay the same. 
The input attributes are also the same, except position data is now 3D instead of 2D. The output color is still the same, and RGB VEC3. The three uniforms in our last video were used to place our moving shapes around the screen. We need uniforms to do the same thing here, but they'll be transformation matrices now. We'll have a model or world, a view, and a projection matrix. GLSL supports matrices and vectors just out of the box, which is nice. We keep passing vertex color to the fragment shader. That stays the same. To find GL position, we'll start off by taking our vertex position. It's a 3D vertex, so now we just need to add one dimension to get it into a VEC4, that extra one value I talked about earlier in the theory section. We can multiply this by the world, view, and projection matrices in that order. And in GLSL, the order things are done is from right to left. The end result is map proj times map view times map world times vec4 vertex position. Now, I want to bring up a super common trick, which is to combine the view and projection matrices before using them in a shader. The reason for this is that both of these generally only change when details about the camera change and stay the same for every object in a scene. We send over a bit less data and do a bit less math in the shader. It's a pretty small optimization, especially for us, but it shows up a lot in shaders in the real world, so I want to put it here just so that you're used to seeing it and know what it does. The fragment shader here stays exactly the same. We'll be looking at this more in the next video. On to the actual demo. We'll wrap everything in a nice try-catch block to show unexpected errors on the page. Make a demo function. We'll get the canvas, GL context, all the same stuff you've seen in both of the previous videos. Next, we'll create our vertex and index buffers with those helper functions that we snagged from the last tutorial code. Whoops, I forgot to export a couple things. Let's fix that. Better. We need a create static index buffer function, which will come in handy in the future, so we'll put it in glutils. It'll be basically the exact same as create static vertex buffer, but binding the element array buffer webgl slot instead of the array buffer slot. Coming back to our main file, we'll create our two index buffers and show an error if one of our buffers failed to create for some reason. Create a WebGL program from the vertex and fragment shader sources we wrote above and grab references to the attributes and uniforms. Make sure the program was created successfully, of course. Thank you, TypeScript. Finally, create the VAOs for the cube and the table using the buffers and attribute numbers that we got above. And all of this is stuff that we've done in previous videos, so hopefully it looks pretty familiar. I'll pull over the browser window to make sure everything works and... Wow, really? First try. Awesome. It's almost like I did this twice already and remembered all my mistakes. With all the shader and geometry set up, let's draw a cube to make sure things are working. Set the canvas width and height properties to the on-screen width and height times the device pixel ratio. Set the background clear color to a very dark gray. Clear the color and depth buffers. Set the viewport. Use the demo program, all stuff we've done in both of the other videos. Now for the different part. We need our matrix uniforms. For some reason, VS Code didn't figure out where map 4 was, so I'll just import it manually from the GL matrix library that we installed earlier, up here, like this. We'll need a world view and projection matrix, and also a combination view projection matrix to send to the GPU. Now, GL Matrix is designed to be very efficient, much more efficient than you and me need it to be, and we'll have to put up with a slightly weird syntax. In GLM, in C++, you can do something like this. Map view proj equals map proj times map view. JavaScript doesn't understand how to use the multiplication operator for two matrices, though, so instead, we have to call this mat4.multiply function. The first parameter, and this is where it's a little bit weird, is the matrix that will receive the result of the multiplication, and the other two parameters are the matrices to multiply together. The order of variables is the same as if we were doing it in this C++ style code, but it's placed in a function instead. Sort of weird, but the optimization here is that we're not creating a bunch of new variables all the time in order to do this intermediate math. 
To upload a matrix uniform, use the uniform matrix 4FV function. The second transpose parameter is false. Another one of those OpenGL inherited API shape things. I love it, don't worry about it. We upload our matrices. We'll worry about filling them in with the correct data in a minute. For now, they're just identity matrices, which is the equivalent of multiplying by one. Bind the VAO and issue a draw call. We use draw elements to issue a draw call that uses an index buffer. The parameters are really similar to draw arrays. What type of geometry? We want triangles. How many vertices to draw, which is actually the number of indices we want to draw. Type is the type of index buffer data. We're using unsigned short, which is the type for 16-bit integers. And the last parameter is the number of indices to skip, which we don't want to skip any, so zero. Pulling over the demo window, you can see that we get a full red screen. Our vertices happen to be aligned in a space that lines up with clip space, so we happen to get a nice clean result like this, but obviously we want to see the 3D thing. So let's go set up our matrix uniforms correctly. We'll leave Matt World alone so that the cube will be positioned in the center of the scene at the origin. To create a view matrix, we use the mat4.lookat function. The first parameter is, again, the matrix to fill with the result of the data. Our other three parameters are the position, focal point, and up direction of the camera. Let's place the camera five units away from the cube on the z-axis, looking directly at the center, and using y as the up direction. To create the perspective projection matrix, use mat4.perspective. The parameters here are the field of view in the y dimension, I'll use 80 degrees, and this function wants that in radians, so we can use the glmatrix.toRadian function to do that conversion for us. The aspect ratio is always the width of the output area divided by the height. And finally, pick some near and far values, 0 0.1 and 100 will work. Pulling over the demo code, it looks wrong. The reason for this is that WebGL is drawing faces that really should be hidden in the background, behind the closer front face. It's a weird and bad visual effect, but we can configure WebGL not to do this. The first thing we can do to avoid this is depth testing. We've been clearing the WebGL depth buffer, which stores information about how far away from the camera each drawn pixel is. Depth testing tells WebGL not to draw a pixel if something closer to the camera has already been drawn at that pixel. Enabling that, we now only see the front face of the cube. Let's move the camera up a bit on the y-axis and to the side. Cool, this is much more obviously a 3D cube. Before we move on, I want to disable depth testing again to show another WebGL configuration that's useful for 3D. Without depth testing, our cube is borked again, neat. The other feature is called back face culling, and we can enable that by using the cull face feature. Refreshing the page, you can see that the cube looks good again. The way this works is by taking advantage of a convention in 3D rendering that triangles facing towards the camera should always show up in a counterclockwise order and the ones facing away from the camera should show up in a clockwise order. If a triangle is defined by this corner, this corner, and this corner, you can see that drawing a rough circle around that direction goes counterclockwise, and that if this cube were rotated around, that little rough circle would go instead clockwise in the other direction. The Mozilla cube that we copied already follows that convention, and so does almost everything that you're going to get from 3D modeling tools. The reason this is helpful is that for a piece of geometry like this that forms a solid shell with no gaps in it, the faces in front will always be obscuring the ones in back. So you can completely skip drawing the back ones and save a lot of fragment processing power on the GPU. It's basically tossing out half of the potential work for free as long as your object is a solid shell like this, which again, most tend to be. Neat, huh? With depth testing alone, all of those hidden triangles would still be processed in the fragment shader, so it's worth bringing in backface culling whenever you're doing stuff in 3D. And you can configure backface culling further. You can say which face you want to use with the cull face function. It defaults to back, but you can set it to front, and you can see that reverses the effect. Similarly, you can configure to WebGL which face is the front face with the front face function. It defaults to CCW for counterclockwise, but you can also use CW for clockwise if for some reason you have faces defined in the reverse direction. 
For 3D, you generally do want both backface culling and depth testing. Okay, future me from the end of the tutorial here. Even with backface culling, you do want depth testing on too, so the background objects don't end up being drawn on top of the foreground ones. You can see the cubes being drawn in the wrong order here when I turn off the depth testing. All right, back to the past. Great, our shape is made. Let's go back and make several shapes with different sizes, locations, and rotations. We'll make a shape class to hold a world matrix for each shape, and a constructor that takes the position, scale, rotation axis, and angle, geometry, VAO, and number of indices to draw. Similar to the last video, we'll make a draw function that takes a WebGL rendering context and world matrix uniform location. To issue the draw call, we'll bind the vertex array, not forgetting to unbind it afterwards, and issue a draw element call to our geometry. And before doing that, we'll send over our saved matte world matrix to the WebGL program using uniform matrix for a fee. And before that, we need to build the world matrix by using matte4.from rotation translation scale. This function takes three parameters, unsurprisingly the rotation, translation, and scale we want to use. Scale is expecting a vector, and rotation expects this new thing called a quaternion. It's sorta like a vector, but follows some very different rules under the hood. I'll link a brilliant 3 blue 1 brown video if you're interested in learning about them, they're fascinating, but all you need to know for here is that you can store a rotation axis and angle in a single vector-like quaternion object. We build the rotation quaternion using quat.setAxisAngle, providing, unsurprisingly again, the rotation axis and angle. Create the scale vector by setting a scale vector with x, y, and z all equal to our decided scale amount, send it into the from rotation translation scale call, and that's it. Back down in our main demo code, we'll make a list of shapes. We'll use this up vector a lot, the positive 1y direction one, so I'll just make a single up vec variable here to reuse. Our first shape will be the table. It's in the center on the ground, so 0, 0, 0 for the position, 1 for the scale, and no rotation. That's 0 degrees around any vector, of fact is fine, and I'll use the table VAO and number of table indices. The next will be our center cube. We'll make it 0 0.4 units wide, so shrink it down 40% of its original size, and bump it up to 0 0.4 units in the air, so that the bottom of the cube is flush with the table square. No rotation on this one either, and use the cube VAO and number of cube indices. Let's change the draw code down here to go through each shape and call draw on it. Refresh the page, and great! We're drawing the table and smaller cube. Let's add in four more cubes around the center one two of them plus one in x and two minus one in x, and put one of each forward in z and one back. We'll make them smaller 0 0.05 for the first, 0 0.1 for the second, 0 0.15 for the third, and 0 0.2 for the fourth. Let's rotate each round a bit too, maybe 20 degrees for the first, 40 for the second, 60 for the third, and 80 for the fourth. Refresh this, and great! Four cubes, different sizes, each rotated by a different angle. Fantastic. Let's add an animation on the camera to make it pan around nicely to get a nice round view of our scene. I'll move the matrix definitions up here above the render code so that we don't reallocate those variables every frame, and I'll put all of this into a frame function, which I repeat with the request animation frame. All this again should look pretty similar to the last video. I'll move our updating logic up here, and our view and projection matrix calculations should go up here since they'll change as the camera moves around. Similar to before, add in performance.now calls to check the clock and get the amount of elapsed time between frames, and make a camera angle variable that gets 10 degrees added to it every second. Set the x and z variables for a camera to 3 times the sine and cosine of the camera angle, respectively, and put those in the position variable for the camera. Also, let's move it down to positive 1 and y just to make it a bit shallower of an angle. Great, looks great. The camera is much lower, sweeping around in a circle around the scene, showing all the cubes, and we're done.
It took us a long time to actually get into the code, and as before, we spent most of our time setting up our buffers and shaders and whatnot, but the rendering code is basically the same as it was in the last video. Use program, update uniforms, draw, repeat. Most of the difficulty in 3D rendering comes from understanding the math concepts that go into it, and learning how to use that math in JavaScript. The WebGL code itself isn't really that much more tricky. Now that you've gone through the code, I suggest you go back and rewatch the theory part at the beginning of this video just to solidify your understanding of what's going on here. It's all quite abstract just looking at the code, but I really hope that understanding this in a fundamental way will make it easier for you to construct elaborate 3D scenes down the road. Projecting 3D shapes into 2D shapes is only part of the battle with making convincing 3D. In the next video, we'll be talking about using fragment shaders to introduce texture and lighting effects that add a much stronger appearance of three-dimensionality to our scenes. As always, thanks for watching, I hope you learned a lot in the video. Cheers, until next time, take care everyone.